Greg McElroy, former Alabama quarterback, the ESPN ABC college football analyst. He'll be calling Florida at Kentucky this Saturday at 7 Eastern and uh, is the host of the Always College Football podcast, uh, ESPN podcast, and co-host on mornings in WJOX in Birmingham, Alabama. And he was on the call for Florida State LSU on Sunday night. Greg, good to have you back. Who did more to lose the game, LSU or Florida State? <laughs> well, they say more games are lost than one, right, Dan? And I mean, I'm not sure there was a better example of that in week one than what we saw there in New Orleans. Uh, a cacophony of errors. But I, I would honestly say the game should have been comfortably in favor of Florida State, whether you look at the fourth and two where they went for it early as opposed to taking the points after they dropped the first punt, the fumble at the end zone at the very end as they're putting the game on ice, that those two plays right there, I mean, those are 14 points. I mean, the game should have been sideways in favor of FSU. So uh, I would say that, that LSU made more mistakes and FSU's inability to really take advantage of those were kind of troubling, if I'm going to be completely honest. You play the position of quarterback. That call comes in where it's a pitch down by the goal line, which I, I don't understand the logic that you would have anything other than take a knee, kick a field goal, or just hand it to him and let your running back take help me understand what that play was or what it should have been. Well, I'm a hundred percent with you. And we had a rule at at all levels of football. The ball never went in the air backwards along the goal line. It just, there's absolutely no reason for it. Now they ran that play earlier in the game. You get into a muddle huddle. You try to create gaps. They have unbalanced set to the right and just pitch it out. But there's just too many things that can potentially go wrong as the field condenses. So I I think it makes absolutely no sense. Like some coaches are willing to put the ball in the air, but I, as a conservative player and understanding the circumstances of the game, a field goal ends it. I mean, you're a buck 25 remaining. I actually thought that there was a real reason for LSU to let them score, because I think that the odds, if you played odds and statistically speaking from an analytical standpoint, I have a better chance of coming down, coming back from two touchdowns than I do stopping them at the one yard line uh, from kicking a field goal. Uh, so, I mean, the the odds actually would say, hey, let them score then get our offense on the field, go down two minute, kick an onside kick, go down, do it again. But either way, I mean, it just made absolutely no sense. So the the risk far outweighed the reward. And if they would have just handed it off and kicked a field goal, it's game set match. Give me the team. Give me the school that played its way out of the final four already. It's hard to say play your way out, um, but Utah would be the team that would, that would come to mind. And it's not because they can't potentially win 12 in a row and get back into the playoff mix. I think that's possible. It's, but uh, what I was most disappointed in Dan, and and I, I don't know if you felt the same way, but when you talk all off season about a team's strength being their front seven defensively and that front seven defensively looked average that's a little concerning if you look at florida for instance and now it's new coach new regime all this other stuff it's fine but florida's offensive line the last five or six years has been less than stellar they've gotten by with smoke and mirrors and dan mullen's run scheme would occasionally get good run yardage but this has not been a mauling group to see florida's offensive line for the first time in five years mauling people off the line of scrimmage was eye-opening especially knowing that that's supposed to be Utah's greatest strength. So uh, I think they can still get back in the mix, but the likelihood of them going 12 in a row, uh, I think is almost an impossibility at this point. Notre Dame, can you have a good loss this early in the season and still be in the hunt? Very much so. I mean, we've seen Ohio State, for instance, 2014, lose week two. They looked awful week one against Navy one. Uh, Week two, they lost to Virginia Tech by two touchdowns. They rallied to win 13 in a row. But that's the type of personnel Ohio State has. I think what I was most troubled by is Notre Dame really lacked a ton of explosiveness as far as their offensive weapons are concerned. Um, Not that they ever really, not that we expected them to be super elite at wide receiver, but I was kind of disappointed. I mean, this is an Ohio State team that really hasn't been great on defense the last couple of years. I know that they're starting over with a new defensive coordinator and Jim Knowles, but I've just thought that there would be more firepower from Notre Dame. So, yeah, they can get back in the mix, but I just don't think you can win like Wisconsin wins every week and 
you know, expect to get to the college football playoff. Like you can't just grind out W's over and over and over again. I mean, you can, but there's going to be a team who catches fire offensively. And if you can't keep up in a shootout, it's going to be a, a problem. So I was impressed by what they did defensively, but offensively, uh, I'm not sure they have, they have the horsepower to get it done. Speaking of which Oregon against Georgia, that, I mean, that's, that would be a no show basically <laughs> like you're there in, in body, but I don't know if you're there in mind and soul. What happened? Was that like, what was your impressions of, I mean, Georgia looked like a finely tuned machine. That was for a week one game against a decent opponent. That was clinic real. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? I mean, have you ever seen a team come out guns a-blazing like that against a solid competition? Well, I, it made me wonder just how good Oregon is. Um, because sure. I, I have my doubts about Georgia just replacing everybody, but still they're still replacing people with people that everybody else in the country wanted. Uh, Stetson Bennett, I, you know, he's just one of those guys that you go, all right, he just kind of gets it done. Right. Kind of like you in college. He just <laughs> gets Stetson's it done. Just kind of a, Stetson's just kind of a baller. I mean, like, you know, he's like one of those guys. It, it, it feels like he's going to get done with the game and, you know, go go to the frat house and, you know, drink a case of beer. Like, he's just such a guy. Like, you know, he's, but you just he's a baller, man. Like he is. He just makes plays. And I think his is he's very creative. He can make the off schedule play. But he played in rhythm the other night, and and their weapons are ridiculous. I mean, they're off. I mean, they got tight ends. Their third best tight end might be, you know, one of the best tight ends in America, and that's Derek Gilbert. Uh, their other two tight ends, Brock Bowers, is um, he's literally Travis Kelsey, and they're the same guy. I mean, they're just unbelievable athleticism. And then they have a tackle, basically tackle body, six eight two eighty, uh, in Darnell Washington, who can run and plays tight end. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're wet and then their weapons on the outside are ridiculous. Their running backs are might be better this year. And that's saying a lot. Cause I thought James cook, who I, is with Buffalo. Now I think he's going to have a phenomenal rookie year. So I, I just think I, I'm, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable to watch what they did the other day. Uh, and nobody wants to, wants to play Georgia if they're playing like that. Talking to Greg McElroy, ESPN, ABC college football analyst. He'll be on the call with Kentucky and Florida this Saturday. When, you guys would get ready at Alabama for a cupcake. North Texas, Florida International, Chattanooga. <laughs> what was Nick Saban's pregame speech with those games as opposed to facing Auburn? Oh, he was much harder on you those weeks. You know, playing Auburn, it's like, all right, guys, hey, let's go out there and play hard. You know, but against Tennessee chat, it's like, if you guys don't do this, 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 you're losing this week. Like, you know, it like then it, it's the craziest thing. And, I you know, I think coach and like every, any coach, you're, you know, they're little kind of minor in psychology. Right. I can vividly remember teeing it up against Tennessee Chattanooga. We were 10 and 0 in 2009, played in the second to last week of the season. 45 to the nothing. Week. 45 to nothing. <laughs> I can vividly remember taking the field being like, we better play well today or we're going to lose. <laughs> Like, I mean, it's like, oh, so you bought into Saban. He, just, he <laughs> convinces you of that. It's like, I, I, and I, I, my, now my senior year, I was, I wasn't quite as naive. Uh, you know, when we're playing against, you know, Georgia State or whoever it was, it's like, all right, we're going to smoke these guys. Like, let's just get out of this thing healthy. Um, but playing against Tennessee Chat my junior year, I mean, he can just, he knows how to press your buttons to the point in which you're never comfortable. You're always uneasy. And when you're uneasy against a team like that, the urgency kind of elevates a little bit. And, you know, he's always going to say, hey, we're going to play to our standard and all this other stuff. So uh, the messaging is is clear. If you don't play well, you will be replaced regardless of who the opponent is. What do you see with with USC? Uh, the, the timetable of them coming back into prominence? Uh, <laughs> I think we are so far out in front of our skis. Uh, right now with SC, uh, people saying they're a playoff team, people saying they're, they're all these other things. They, they might very well be, um, but it's going to be by a process of elimination in the Pac-12. Like If they make it to the college football playoff, it's going to be because they beat a bunch of teams that probably, probably aren't elite in an effort to get there. Um, but SC, if you have a quarterback, you have a chance, right? Always. 
and they have an elite quarterback. I mean, Caleb Williams is phenomenal. Uh, has a couple years of eligibility left, but he'll be a top five pick, no doubt about it. Game changer. Uh, but what I was most impressed with the other day was their ball hawking mentality on defense. And look, Oklahoma had their fair share of ups and downs in Lincoln Riley's tenure on the defensive side, but I actually think they got it right with the hire. It's just going to take a couple of years at Oklahoma to kind of change the culture, but the defensive culture at SC has been lethargic for a really long time. That was probably one of the more inspired defensive performances I've seen. I know it was Rice. Like, let's not get carried away, but you have three pick sixes. I mean, there's something to be said there. Mm -hmm. That was the first time they've had multiple pick sixes in a game, I think, in like 20 years. And they had, I believe, one defensive touchdown last year. They had three in the first game of the Lincoln Riley era. So I think they're ahead of schedule. But for us to now starting to starting to lump them in with the best teams in college football, I they've got a long way to go before they get there. We always uh, crown a September Heisman. <laughs> and it might be Anthony Richardson, the Florida quarterback. It, it, it feels like the guy who is unbelievable in September and maybe not so much in December. Although I'm hearing great things about Richardson that he could be a top 10 draft pick. I mean, is that far fetched that he was behind Kyle Trask and that guy could be, you know, a higher draft pick than Trask? No, because I mean, we've seen that before. I mean, like Mitch Trubisky was now make what make of it what you what you will. I mean, he was a backup until his senior year behind a guy that was mobile because he was a better fit for the offense. So uh, I think sometimes it's just while Trask was a good player, uh, was an accurate thrower. I think the more unjustifiable guy that was in front of him on the depth chart was Emory Jones. Uh, he was the starter throughout all of last year and Anthony Richardson played at times, but probably should have been the guy from the jump based on what we've seen. When I watch this guy, I see Vince Young. Um, the, people have compared him to Cam Newton. People have compared him to Tebow. Uh, I, I don't see it that way at all. I think uh, Tebow was a power runner. He was essentially a fullback, you know, playing quarterback. Um, and then Cam was a little bit more physical as well, where it's mostly going to be about his raw power and he's going to pick up your five and six yards. Now he can get in the open field, but Cam was more physically imposing. When I watch Anthony Richardson, I see Vince Young because of the fluidity and the effortless nature with how he kind of mm. goes about his business. I mean, it's just, he's so fluid and he's moving. He doesn't even look like he's running, but he's faster than anyone on the field. Uh, he can just the way his body and his head moves and his arm moves and just everything. If you watch them side by side, the comparison is it's unique just how similar they are. Now, I would also compare him to a sophomore Vince Young. And I grew up in Dallas and went to the Texas Oklahoma game every year. So I watch Vince Young come of age over the course of a four year period. And Vince Young as a sophomore is about where Anthony Richardson is. The freak show athleticism is on display every week. but there's also a certain like he's a little erratic at times in the passing game. He isn't great on the downfield throws, but it's in there. So it's coming. It's just he, that's the path that he's on right now. So, yes, he will, I think, in time be a super elite multidimensional player. But right now he's just such a God given athlete. It's just incredible to watch. Before I let you go, I mentioned this uh, in the first hour of the program that we're going to 12 teams by 2026 unless they break the contract and then they move this up a little bit sooner. But that's a lot of time in college football because a lot of things happen r quickly. And I'm wondering if it's a three-year window here. And I'm wondering if there's a restructuring of college football over three years to get us to this 12-team playoff where maybe we have 50 or 60 teams that are the haves and then you have the have-nots. It, 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 am I too far down the road too quickly uh, with with what what I think is eventually going to happen in college football, uh, I think that actually the twelve team playoff uh, kind of slows that down a little bit, Dan. To be honest with you, um, I thought that that was where we were heading, uh, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be a you know a three year period, a five year period, a ten year period. With the grant of rights deal with the ACC, you know they're fairly stable until twenty thirty six or so. Um, but I think the twelve team playoff cools further expansion for the moment and partly because of the automatic qualifiers right now the the structure that they're going to kind of promote is a six uh, a 12 team playoff with six automatic qualifiers meaning 
the top six conference champions, as far as the rankings concerned, will automatically make the playoff. It doesn't matter if you're from the Mountain West or the American or the Pac-12, the Big 12, the SEC or the Big 10. The reward for winning the SEC and the Big 10 is the exact same as the reward for winning uh, a more gettable Pac-12. So what would be the reasoning for, say, an Oregon to leave and join the Big Ten immediately. I, I don't think that they're going to be in a huge rush. I also don't think that the Big Ten is in a huge rush to further expand. But does it make Everyone's more kinda... sense, though, Greg, that, you know, USC, why not stay in the Pac-12? Where if you get right. an automatic berth or Oklahoma, why not stay in the Big 12 instead of going in with the big boys here? And, and maybe there's so much more money to be made, but I, I was wondering about that. If you get an automatic berth... And you win the Big 12, who cares? I mean, <laughs> right? You get that money, and uh, or if you win the Pac-12 in your USC. Well, I, I, you're right. But, I mean, when we're talking about, you know, maybe double what they'll make annually, uh, I'm not sure what the Pac-12's deal is going to look yeah. like. That deal is being currently negotiated. I think it'll be, based on what I've heard, I've heard they might even structure it in a way where every team kind of has their own deal in an effort to... You know, if there is future expansion, there's not a grant of rights. You, so basically, let's say ESPN, for instance, gets the deal that they sign a deal with Oregon. They sign a deal with Pac-12, but Oregon's payout's different from Cal. And that would kind of adjust accordingly. So if Oregon went to the Big Ten, then ESPN could retain Oregon's rights and thus get a piece of the Big Ten deal. I don't, I don't you know, I don't know. I, these are all these all rumor and hearsay. But you're right. I mean, you wouldn't. Because if you're playing in the Big Ten, the likelihood of getting into the playoff is still increasingly high because of the strength of schedule. Um, so SC and UCLA will still be benefited after having made the move financially and because of the schedule that they'll be able to play. But you're right. I mean, the Pac-12 will probably be a one-bid league. Yeah. The Big Ten might have as many as four in the college football playoff in an expanded field. So there's still a lot of value to being aligned with the big boys. Uh, thanks for talking to us. We always appreciate it. And uh, have fun, Florida and Kentucky, this Saturday night at uh, 7 Eastern on the Mothership. Thank you, Greg. You're the best, buddy. Appreciate it. That's uh, Greg McElroy, host of the Always College Football Podcast on uh, ESPN. <laughs> 